Good evening, everyone. It's really great to be back playing live music again and hearing straight music. And I think I've got a beautiful program for you tonight and lots of cool pieces, and maybe you'll hear some things you hadn't heard before and learn some new stuff about the pieces. I'm sure you're all familiar with Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, and it's particularly famous for its outside movement. You've got the slow and somber march in the first one and that dark and fast presto at the end. However, the middle movement, maybe upon first listen, seems out of place. It's this innocuous little minuet and trio style piece, and it seems so light and quick compared to these outside movements. Liszt, however, knew that there's a reason for this. He said that the middle movement was like a flower between two chasms. I'm gonna present you a new flower between two chasms tonight. Chopin's Nocturne in B-flat major, beats up on either side by Ravel's Gaspard de la Nuit and Prokofiev's Seventh Piano Sonata. Ravel is frequently called a French Impressionist, but I think that this title is a little bit limiting for him, both as a composer and as a person. He frequently experimented with other forms of expression and found a lot of inspiration in different genres and different mediums. In particular, he and some of his colleagues would get together weekly and they would uh, read poetry to each other. Ravel was also, as was common in French high art at the time, um, fascinated with the macabre and with horror. So those th two things put together might make you think of, say, Edgar Allan Poe. But there's a French counterpart to Edgar Allan Poe by the name of Aloysius Bertrand. Bertrand wrote this set of poetry, all based on horror, entitled Gaspard de la Nuit, which is, of course, where Ravel gets his inspiration for this suite. Ravel chose three uh, pieces of poetry from that set, on being Le Gibet in Scarborough and, as it were, set them to music. The first movement, on being, is about this French water spirit from folklore. And much like a siren from the Odyssey, this Ondine would sing with this beautiful voice and lure men to her. And the somewhat dark side of this is that in the folklore, Ondine was this immortal, soulless creature. And she would lure these men to her and then kill them to steal their souls. So in this piece, Ravel uses this thematic element of that kind of horror, which is, you know, something that's sweet and alluring at first, but when it comes closer, if you get caught in this trap, it's deadly. The second movement, Les Gibets, is this stark, gruesome image of a man dying on a gibbet. One commentator has said that it was like that moment between almost no life and absolute death. In the poem, there's these um, awful little creepy crawly things like spiders, which ties a noose of silk around its neck and other imagery like that. And there's a couple interesting things in this piece that Ravel did that it kind of separated it from the poetry. The first thing is that um, Ravel sets the man's death in the very middle of the piece, whereas the poem sets the man's death at the very end. And he does this in a fascinating way. The, the harmonies grow more and more dissonant, and voices drop out one by one until all you're left with is this tolling funeral bell and a single voice that outlines the first four notes of the Dies Irae. Now, if you're not familiar with the Dies Irae, it's this sort of classical music in symbol, as it were that it describes this, or is, it is this Gregorian chant which was sung at French funerals. And so it's frequently used as a symbol for death, hell, and the underworld, that sort of thing. After this, then Ravel seems to have a reaction to the man's death. This somewhat more desperate and longing lyrical voice comes out, and then it seems to grow into resignation, as if he understands that he too will die as this man on the gibbet. The last movement, Scarbo, is about this other supernatural creature from French folklore. Scarbo is this sort of imp, goblin-esque creature, and it has these beetle-like characteristics, which is where the word Scarbo comes from, from scarab. Well, Scarbo shows up at this man's room at midnight, and he starts making these noises and running around, causing mischief and these elements like his fingernails grating along the side of the man's bed frame and terrifying him. Well, 
Maybe that was Scarlet right there. <laughs> Ravel has these, this story that plays throughout it. He splits themes into two groups. One represents the man in his bedroom. It's this romantic, lyrical, ascending line, and it's very human. These other groups, these other, this other group of themes, are all very inhuman. They're supernaturally fast, they're skittish, they're scary, and they all represent Scarbo. Ravel developed these two ideas by having them sort of dialogue with each other, and there's obviously some struggle and this battle between Scarbo and the man in his bedroom that finally comes to a head and the man seems to win, and Scarbo disappears into the night. A couple things about this piece. One is that Ravel intended it to be difficult, and in fact, very, very difficult. He wanted it to be more difficult to play than Balakirov's Islami, which was notorious for the time for being the most challenging piece the pianist could play. I think Ravel succeeded in this regard, <laughs> and you'll see why. But he does so in an extremely musically effective manner. Every single element of this piece that's made to be difficult, and there are very many of them, all serve some purpose to further the imagery of the poem. Those skittish and fast melodies that represent Scarbo and these extreme walls of sound that he presents at the climaxes. And they all serve to give an image of the piece of the poem. The other thing about this piece, um, actually I believe that is what I want to cover. The other thing is the two themes that are put together. So as you listen to this, you can hear in Undine that watery texture and the singing voice in Le Gibet, a tolling funeral bell, and that stark harmonies, and in Scarborough, that supernaturally fast creature from the French folklore.